my name's Bernadette Russell. Welcome to episode 18 of my podcast, How to Be Hopeful. A podcast all about hope, how to find it and how to keep hold of it once you've found it. This week I'm very pleased to be talking to Chris Williams, a friend of mine who is currently living in Beirut with his partner, Gemma. As most of you will know, on the 4th of August there was a terrible explosion in Beirut which caused uh, great suffering and loss and Chris talks to us about his experience of the explosion and uh, what he witnessed and how hope can be found even in the midst of terrible disaster. Thank you for listening. Here he is. Is that better if my video... Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Do you know, hopefully, you. yeah, hopefully it will be mostly you, so that's okay. <laughs> how, how are you? How are you doing today, you and Gemma? Yeah, we're, we're okay. Like it's been kind of strange few days. So yeah, we're, we're feeling, we're feeling all right. Yeah. Um, given the circumstances. Yeah, very extreme circumstances. So um, obviously you're living in Beirut and, and it'd be great to have a conversation with you about recent tragic events there but just for mm. context could you would you mind just telling us how you ended up in Beirut and what you've been doing there since since you since you arrived and since you've been living there yeah sure um we we've been here since October um and we I guess we just wanted to we've been feeling like this for a while but we wanted to have a little bit of an adventure and to go somewhere um to live abroad for a little while uh, we wanted to go somewhere that was quite different from the UK, um, but also somewhere where uh, the things that we enjoy are still there. So really great food and um, and bars and nightlife and, um, you know, lots of uh, fun things to do, going to the sea, going to the mountains. Um, and we looked at lots of different places, but Beirut and Lebanon just really, really ticked the boxes for us. Um and we're, we're really lucky that we both do a lot of freelance work. So we can kind of do that from anywhere, really. So we, we've been still working for, um, you know, in, in jobs in the UK, but, but out here, um, which was a, a lot easier. We, we thought that might be really difficult. We were worried about it. But actually, especially, you know, over the last few months during coronavirus, everybody's meetings and everything have been via Skype or, or FaceTime or whatever anyway. So actually now everybody else is in the same boat as us working remotely from home. So Yeah, so it, so that's sort of made it the usual experience, hasn't it? Which is Yeah. Which yeah. is good. Yeah, it's quite strange. So what ha- Chris, what have you and your partner Gemma been what's what kind of work have you been doing uh remotely from Berry mm. in the UK? So uh, Gemma works um, in fundraising for for charities. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, a lot of her work now is actually in um, conservation and wildlife and environment charities. Um, so she does a lot of the fundraising work <coughs> for, for, for freelance clients for different charities. Um, and then I uh, run, I co-run a theatre company, a charity in the UK as well. Um, there's two of us as directors. So um, the other director, Sheena, was kind of running things on the ground in the UK. And then I was doing all of the sort of um, the boring uh, <laughs> fundraising and yeah. you know, budgets and, and all of that kind of stuff. So I was quite lucky with that, that, you know, she was quite, and our, and our trustees, our board of trustees as well, was sort of like, yeah, it's fine, you go off and, and do that remotely, and then Sheena's on the ground, uh, you know, running that kind of thing. It's really inspiring to hear that you could make that bolder choice and that it worked. I think that's really, mm. it, it really inspiring. Yeah, and I think again with with um, with coronavirus, because people, you know, people are, have not been able to go into the office and they've had to work from home, and actually people are seeing that work quite well. And, and I've heard from some people that they've kind of said, well. Actually, now when I have to have a meeting, I, I can just do it via Skype. I don't have to trek an hour across London to go and have that meeting. Yeah. Um, 
and so I think people are suddenly realizing actually you don't have to be so tied to you know kind of going all going into an office every day and you can work remotely quite easily and it that for, for me that suddenly makes the world a much smaller closer place yeah it kind that makes sense no it, it does I agree and it feels like the interconnectedness that is sort of revealed or exposed is is of of positive things actually that you know it's made mm. us do things that now now we're like okay we can do this so it's it's easy and you know it's more environmentally yeah. friendly isn't it not to be driving or getting on a bus somewhere and yeah yeah so that's all, yeah of course so great and so Beirut which of which I know very little about but just sounds amazing from from your description mm. so as well as continuing for you and Gemma continuing your work in the UK did you have you sort of been getting up to stuff in in Beirut this amazing lovely city with loads of exciting things going on yeah yeah I mean it's 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 Lebanon as a country is uh just amazing because it's tiny like it's 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 such a small country uh Beirut's kind of sort of halfway up the country and you know you can be right far in the south or right up in the north you know with like in an hour and a half um so you it's really easy to see the whole country and the the you know everywhere is different each town or village that you go to is completely different from the last one and the scenery is you know you, you can from Beirut you know within a, in less than an hour you can be right up in the mountains um where there's you know skiing in winter Le- Lebanese people love to ski you know there's certain times that you, people always say that you can go skiing in the morning and then you can be on the beach in the afternoon I mean it depends <laughs> depends how you know cold you're happy to be on the beach you know you could go for a swim but the water would be pretty cold if you were at that time of the year yeah um but that's kind of it sums up the country really that you can there's so many different places to visit and then Beirut is kind of you know itself very different to a lot of the country it's got really amazing food it's got fantastic nightlife um and clubs uh it's it's kind of got everything really um and it's really you know everyone everyone Lebanese people particularly always joke that um uh, Europeans love going to Beirut because it has this feeling of organized chaos uh I kind of you know particularly like you know the the roads are, are are crazy and um there's a feeling of people can people kind of do what they want in Beirut it's very free and easy and um it's just it's such a great place to be in and and the 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 overwhelming thing for me I think is that um it doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from the people here are so welcoming in in a in a way that sort of particularly for British people I think we're kind of suspicious of it and taken aback and I remember we were here in maybe our first week and we were, um, I think we were walking to the supermarket or something like that. And it was early in the morning and suddenly there's somebody shouting at us from a, a balcony. Um, and we were kind of thinking, oh, have we, are we somewhere we shouldn't be? Have we done something wrong? Who is this, you know? Uh, and then we suddenly realised that it was just some guy on his balcony who wanted us to go into his house to drink coffee with him and his oh wife. Oh my God, that's so amazing. And we were like, we were, we were so suspicious of it. Yeah. And then we just, we, you know, we went in and we sat for an hour and we had coffee and, and biscuits and chatted. And and that kind of set the tone, really, for us, that that's just, you know, the Lebanese people, really, their sense of warmth and hospitality and, and being welcome is just very, very different yeah. um, to the UK, where we're kind of a bit more reserved and, you know... That's so beautiful. And do you think, Chris, was he, do you think he was sort of interested, was like, oh, they look like they're not, they're not from here. You know, do you think it was a sort of in, <laughs> interest in you? No, I mean, in a positive way, sort of an interest yeah, in you. Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's, um, I mean, there's a, on, on one hand, I think there's a, there's an inquisitiveness, um, you know, where clearly, not Lebanese, you know, Gemma's, Gemma's got blonde hair, we're clearly, you know, European, so there's that kind of, 
uh, yeah, inquisitiveness and wanting to chat to us and wanting to make sure that we feel welcome in, in their country. Um, but then there's a, there's a sort of like, there's a sadness to that in a way, because certainly, you know, Lebanon in the past has had periods of being, you know, a real tourist destination. Mm. And it's got every, you know, it's, it has so many things that make it a great tourist destination. But in recent times, um, that's, you know, they just haven't had the tourists come in here. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a that's um, something to do with the, the, the way that Lebanon is perceived um, in, you know, in Europe, um, uh, because of its history and it's interesting isn't it it feels like it's about stories again it's about the stories we hear and and, and what gets told mm. and, and what gets shared and, and it, it, it's why it's sort of really great to hear different versions of things I think which is beautiful because I found your Facebook post which we'll come on to in a moment just so mm. beautifully beautifully written and also really moving um before we go on obviously that that's lovely but we obviously everybody that's listening will be aware that there was this terrible massive explosion in Beirut on the on the 4th of August and I was just catching up with the details yeah. of which of course you're going to know a lot more and on the ground but for those who are listening who mm. might not be confident about the details um so the, the disaster was preceded by this enormous fire at the port of Beirut and then around 6 p.m the roof of the warehouse caught fire the warehouse had been mm-hmm. storing 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate so there's this initial explosion followed by a series of smaller blasts I think a lot of people witnessed that sounding like fireworks and then then we all saw Mm. this explosion this mushroom cloud explosion and the supersonic blast I mean that was Mm. so shocking and that is what caused uh, as far as I'm aware a lot lot of the damage so hospitals got overwhelmed as far as I'm aware there is at least 158 people dead, 6,000 people injured, and 300,000 people homeless, which is, you know, those statistics are extraordinary. And a lot of anger because mm. the ammo- ammonium nitrate, which caused that explosion, had been left in the warehouse for, for six years, <laughs> despite all those. Yeah. So I know that you, obviously, that those are the sort of numbers, and I'm aware that you and Gemma and your cat uh, were pretty close mm-hmm. to, the, to the epicentre do you mind mm. if, we, if it's not too hor- horrible for mm. you to discuss it? Could you just talk us a little bit about your experience as being so close to that? Because I know you mentioned the next forty-eight hours were grueling and the, and the flat was destroyed. So, if it's okay, could you talk us through your experience? Yeah, there? yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Of course. Um, so we, we uh, fortunately, we're not in our apartment at the time. We were. Um, about probably about uh, two kilometers, I would guess, away from the port. Um, we were actually taking uh, Arabic lessons, which uh, is incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun and it's a really interesting language, but it's really really hard. Um, so we we were at an Arabic school uh, about uh, and get uh, I think about two kilometers. I'm not very good with estimating distances but um it's in for anyone that knows Beirut it's in a place called Sassine Square um and we were maybe halfway through the lesson and suddenly there was a a a kind of shaking I guess it, it which felt um to me felt exactly like an earthquake um which I've, I've only felt like a, a proper earthquake once before, and that was in Indonesia, and it was it was terrifying because it, I just you know it's such a weird feeling. Yeah. So it, it felt like a sort of a vibrating of the building and a heavy shaking. Yeah. Um, but without without any real sound initially, and that lasted maybe a second or two seconds, uh, and the lights went out, which is quite normal in Beirut. We have a quite a lot of power cuts um but particularly at the moment the the country a lot of places are getting maybe two hours of electricity a day because of the economic situation so you know that there's all that that this is on top of um so the lights going out wasn't a particularly surprising thing to happen but then there was this i, I would say probably two or th- two or three seconds although it's you know kind of 
felt a bit slow motion, so it was difficult to tell. And then there was a an incredibly loud uh, bang or crashing sound, uh, and followed by just the sound of glass shattering that sounded like it was coming from everywhere. Um, luckily, the the room that we were in was a small room with kind of small. The window had very small panes, and they didn't shatter. But the, our initial response was be, because it's Beirut and because of its history was that there um, that it was a bomb and that it was it it felt very close to us. Um, so we kind of jumped up, moved away from the windows. Um, tried to get a, tried to listen to see if we could get a sense of what was going on um we i went straight on twitter actually because um whilst it's not the most reliable source of information it's you know you can often quickly find out if there's something going on and because this sound had been heard throughout the entire city and, and even much further away um the reports were of multiple explosions because like to, we thought the explosion was where we were so everybody else thought the same thing yeah and suddenly there's these reports of different explosions everywhere and it was only until after a few maybe five minutes that we started to get reports that it was one explosion um but you know our initial um reaction as well was to call the uk embassy and um I managed to get through to them, but at this point they didn't know anything about it. They hadn't had any other reports, so they kind of just told us to stay where we were. Um, and then we we started to realise quite quickly that it was this one explosion at the port um, and that it was kind of finished, I guess, in a way that it wasn't, you know, like it wasn't an attack on multiple bombings or anything and that we, we could then go out onto the balcony of this building to take a look at what would have had happened and every window that you could see was smashed out the road was covered in glass there were cars with um you know things had fallen on the cars um and it, it was it was chaos because a lot of the people who were out in the street ha didn't know what was going on yet you know people were frightened and panicked and cars everywhere um and then we once we realised that it was the port, we we live maybe 600 metres from the port. So we, uh, when you see on the news that the the main couple of streets where the the, the main the residential streets where the main uh, damages to people's homes, that's basically where our apartment was. Um, and we we didn't know what the scale of damage was down there at that point. So we walked, we started walking towards it. And gradually the damage was getting worse and worse and um, obviously lots of people injured. Uh, so at this point we started to realise that, you know, things were going to be bad once we got to our apartment. Um, and luckily we, I guess, live in a, a building that's, um, there's lots of these types of apartment blocks in, in Beirut that are kind of relatively modern, but they're Con really solid concrete shells so the buildings themselves didn't collapse or anything in the blast a, lo a lot of the older buildings did um, so we were able to get into our apartment block in, in relative safety um, and as you mentioned before our at this point our main concern was you know we've got lots of belongings in there but our main concern was this cat yeah. that we were fostering because um there's this really amazing charity here called Animals Lebanon, um, and they rescue animals, mostly cats and dogs, um, and they try to rehome them. But the ones, the if it's not a kitten, I think they they find it a little bit more difficult to rehome them. So they they foster them out. So we took this cat called Mouse, <laughs> um, who'd had a bit of a tough time. I think he'd been hit by a car and uh, we don't know where he was before that and then he was taken to a vet but they didn't know what to do with him so they kept him in a cage in a basement for three months um so he the poor little guy had had a really tough time but he came to us and, and lived with us for a while and so our main concern at this point was to find him and we went into the flat 
searched everywhere and we, we couldn't find him. Um, so we, I guess we, we assumed that maybe he'd run away because it was scary. And I, w- when we went into the flat, the windows were all blown out and the window frames were all collapsed into the building. All of the doors, the front door, all the internal doors had been blown off. Um, lots of really surprising things like the um, the oven, uh, which had been in the kitchen, had somehow been blown out of the kitchen door and was on the balcony. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, yeah. And the, the sofa was at the other side of the room. Like, lots of very heavy items were just, like, Yeah, I mean, they're, thrown around. they're seriously bulky things, aren't they? That's shocking. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Uh, so it was a real mess. Um, and at this point, for us, you know, it's, it's starting to get dark and we didn't want to be in that building in the dark because obviously the electricity was gone. There was water dripping. You could kind of smell gas because not everything had been turned off by this point. So we just wanted to get out, grabbed the essentials, passports, things like that. Um, and then left, but you know, there's no like taxis or anything that can get in there. So we had this like really long 45 minute hour long, walk through the rubble to get out and there's you know up you can imagine the kind of i won't go into graphic detail but you can imagine that there's lots of injured people and it's uh, lots of panicked people and scared people and that was kind of the worst point of it i guess um and you know we uh, <clears throat> after we left we suddenly realized that there was loads of stuff loads of our belongings in there that we could have salvaged and um also we started to think that we thought mouse the cat would probably go back there so we we decided we should go back there <clears throat> first thing the next day um and obviously didn't you know we we didn't really want to go back it was quite a um you know upsetting to to be there and all that kind of thing but we so we went back there to salvage stuff and i think this is for me is where you know, I think I said this in the Facebook post that you mentioned earlier that um, the what I expected to be a an upsetting trip back was actually really kind of heartwarming and moving because the streets were just full of people um, who had just come straight there to help, you know, to do what they could. There's, there's people bringing... Um, Manusha, which is the, this Lebanese people love it. It's like the, the staple breakfast of Lebanon. It's like a kind of a flatbread pizza type thing with cheese or or thyme on it. And there's people. There's just like hundreds of people with hundreds of these manusha, giving them out and giving bottles of water out and and offering, you know, asking you if you need somewhere to stay and if if you're hurt, if you need to talk to somebody. And that, you know, as I said, that first feeling that we had when we moved to Lebanon of this kindness and warmth and welcoming it was it was that but kind of times times a hundred you know that this everybody pulling together in this like really really bleak time for Lebanese people that they're straight onto the streets to help people yeah Um, I felt I mean that your that section of your Facebook post was so incredibly beautifully moving but I have to say Chris as well also really encouraging because it's horrendous what you've all experienced but on the outside of it it's also really important to hear that because it's encouraging and I think actually it's really important isn't it for people to feel hopeful that actually people are looking out for each other because otherwise it's just so bleak Um, so I'm really grateful for you for reporting that and so pleased to Mm. hear that that and not surprised I have to say that that was happening um and and it did it did make it did does make people feel more hopeful that even at the absolute worst of times people try to help each other so that that's a really good example to me one of those stories I was talking Mm. about let's hear that as well you know let's not just hear the Mm. so you made it back to the flat (laughs) um through that oh yeah 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 so we, we 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 um uh, yeah, sorry, my story's probably a little bit rambling, actually. No, 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 it's perfect, it's, um, it's not at all, it's beautiful. It's quite, it's quite difficult to, like, remember 
like what days things have happened on because of course. It, even now I have absolutely no idea what day of the week is <laughs> so like you know um so yeah so then we went we we, we made it back um we started kind of rooting through trying to salvage things um we'd lost a lot of stuff like um the my computer had sort of disappeared we think it had been sucked out of the window or something like that you know um but we started rooting through things and then I I, I was uh, uh, picking something up off the floor and I happened to glance across under the sofa and Mouse the cat was um, under there hiding. Oh, that's great. Uh, so I ran across and I, I, I reached under and um, tried to give him a little stroke and he meowed and he, he blinked and he looked, you know, like he was all right, I, I, I think, <laughs> uh, as he could be. He was terrified, obviously. Um, so we straight away called Animals Lebanon, who have been doing this really amazing work for the last few days um, with a big team of volunteers, you know, going into all of the buildings, looking for pets that have been lost, finding pets, reuniting them with um, their guardians. And uh, so we called them straight away and, and just said, look, we found him. We can't quite see if he's injured or anything, but he's terrified. Um, we didn't have a cat carrier or anything, so we, you know we needed them to to bring one. And they turned up, and they had been. I mean, they've got a big team, but two of them turned up. Both of them were kind of covered in sweat and dust, and they'd just come from another building that looked like it was about to collapse, and they'd gone into it, climbed under a bed to rescue this little kitten, and got it out before the before it collapsed. And uh, on the way up to us, they found another cat on our staircase, so they rescued that. They didn't have enough bags, uh, carry cases, so they just kind of stuffed it in a backpack yeah. to get it out of there. And they came in, got Mouse, and, and um, so they've taken him back uh, into their care uh, for now, so he's safe. And that was that was such a relief to us because we we just we didn't want to leave the apartment knowing that he might be that he might have survived and that he'd be out there somewhere. Um, so it was such a kind of relief after that i just kind of felt like okay what whatever amongst this of our possessions we can save is fine what you know we, we can replace those um yeah as long as the cats are right <laughs> yeah no well it's another you know. example of the enormous kindness and compassion of people there isn't it mm. not only yeah people bringing yeah. food and water to survivors and etc but also helping people reunited with their furry family yeah <laughs> um yeah just yeah, to sort of yeah. put it in a bit of context chris because i'm aware that some people might not be fully aware of the situation my understanding mm. and correct me if i'm wrong is that lebanon um was already in a financial crisis which had obviously been made by the mm. coronavirus virus this my yeah. understanding is the in terms of the background that it's the worst economic crisis since the the 75 uh, 1975 civil war mm. so there'd already been power cuts as you mentioned some lack yeah. of safe drinking water and limited public health care so for, i mean mm. that that made it when i sort of really realized that that made it particularly sort of horrific because you'd already got businesses shutting and, and goods basic yeah. goods expenses etc um and I know that recently there'd been, on, on the Saturday, I believe, on the 8th, there'd been a lot of protests, um, including some people storming government mm. buildings and stuff. Um, were you were you aware mm. of those protests as well? And do, do, yeah. Do you know yeah. anyone that was involved I, in that? Or um, Yeah, I mean, well, uh, what's interesting, actually, is that, uh, that this is what, when we first arrived in Beirut in October... Um, there was we were already aware that there was a an economic crisis. Um, you know, I mean, the, 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 obviously, without going into too much history, Le Lebanon has, has since the civil wars has there's always been lots of issues still, lots of problems with the country, and um, you know, when you talk to people about the problems now. They're like, no, it's it's not. We're not suddenly in an economic crisis. This is thirty years in the making. Yes, yes. Um, and when we arrived, there was 
the, 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 the more obvious economic crisis, if you like, was beginning um, or had begun. And within maybe a week of us being here, um, the protests, the October protests started, um, the, the revolution or the, the Thawra, um, as it is in Arabic. And uh, they were huge, like enormous um, protests in the street. And we went to um, the, uh, twice, I think we went. One was once was the really, really big Saturday protest. Yeah. And what was incredible about that is that it felt like the whole country, we, we learned loads about the kind of politics and history and what was going on really quickly because we were there. Um, but it felt like the whole country coming together, which is quite can be quite unusual in Lebanon because um, the, the politics is quite sectarian. Uh, you know, different areas of the country tend to be um, different religions, different sects of religions. Um, so this amazing thing was happening where everyone was coming out onto the streets uh, to demand change. And it resulted in the government um, resigning and a new government being brought in. Um, so there was some sense that maybe that would could improve things. I mean, so most people were still not satisfied with that um, because they just felt like it was the old brigade bringing in new people, but really they were just the same old. Um, and that after that, the the um, what really hurt the economy is the exchange rate, which is um, basically for for many years the the Lebanese currency has been pegged at a set rate to the dollar. Yes, yeah. To the US dollar, but it's artificial, so it, it's not really. You know how, like, the pound, UK pound, for example, changes against all other currencies depending on the value. Yes. And that's kind of its real value. The value of the Lebanese money is is artificially set against the dollar, and it's it basically over the period of a few months, it just completely drifted away from it and lost like 70 or 80 percent of its value and that that's what's really kind of crashed the economy and as that was happening coronavirus came yeah i mean it's horrendous and everything shut down yeah it, it, yeah it, it's really horrendous yeah. so that's the look... kind of backdrop against which a very interesting entry point for you and, and Gemma mm. as well to to sort of almost walk straight into a revolution <laughs> to arrive straight into those, yeah. those protests is, yeah. is really amazing. Yeah, I read a little bit about, I mean, e economics is a big and new learn for me, but I my, I know that the um, mm. talks with the International Mon Monetary Fund stalled and, and, and the bailout conversation mm. sort of stalled, and it just seems like blow after blow after blow. So I can understand, of obviously understand the, ang the anger and, 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 and the protest continuing. Um, I saw yesterday that the United Nations said mm. that the country needed 76 million for emergency and humanitarian aid, partly sort of rebuilding of infrastructure. And, mm -hmm. and, and an awful lot of people here have been horrified at what's what's going on. So I know, I know this is a kind of big question, but for people that are listening that are outside and that are looking mm. at this, I wondered if you might be able to share, Chris, what you think kind of where people mm. might be able to donate if they if they're able to. What what specific causes that you think, as somebody that's living there, is, are the best places to give to if you're able to donate? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not an expert, obviously, but um, I I think the the the, the well, there's a couple of things I'd say. One is um, any any Lebanese person will tell you just make sure you're giving the money in a way that's not going to end up with the government because they don't trust the government with the money. Right. Um, so there's there's a number of NGOs uh, and small campaigns doing really brilliant stuff. What I would say is it it depends kind of where you're you know, what's closest to your heart, really. So there's um, the Lebanese Red Cross, um, who actually pretty much provide the ambulance service in Lebanon. Um, so they're doing a lot of the kind of like the, the medical and rescue work. They've set up kind of loads of tents and 
temporary kind of um, medical facilities in the area. Um, uh, so that that's a kind of they're quite a, a big, a fairly big one, I guess. Um, and then there's other there's there's one called um, uh, Impact Lebanon, who are they're quite a, they're quite an interesting um, organisation because they don't necessarily normally have specific um, aims and objectives, but they're interested in. Um, good causes and um, things that are that kind of empower the Lebanese people uh, to fix issues and to make things better and to make the world better. So for them, this obviously this has happened and currently they are now focused on, um, uh, I think their main thing is trying to find shelter uh, for people that need it, but they're also doing some medical and rescue stuff. Um, for animal lovers, I would definitely suggest looking at Animals Lebanon. Obviously, you know, the the humanitarian side of things comes first, and that's on, that's on a much bigger scale. Um, but anim, Animals Lebanon, you know, they're not going to be getting the same scale of funding from people for this. Um, and they're and they're working so hard, it's 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 brilliant. So I would if you're an animal lover, I would recommend looking at um Animals Lebanon. Um but there's there's lots of other smaller ones. Um, I I can't remember the names of them all to be honest. But there's there's um, I know the the Guardian did uh, a little article where they they listed a few with some explanations of exactly what they do because I think that's you know often you you see like a a disaster in another country and there's that sort of one big humanitarian appeal and you just put your money into it and it's not very specific. But here there's you know, if you do a bit of research and, and find one that kind of speaks to you or that you think is important. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, anything helps, I guess. No, it don't. Yeah. I'll find the Guardian article as well. That's a really good tip because I think it can be a little bit overwhelming. And like you said, I think I think there's a little bit of sort of is this with every appeal now, there's like, is my money as much as I'm able to give going to get to to people? So I think. I think it's really mm. great to sort of, it's great that anybody is compiling a list and, and sort of helping people know where to direct their financial aid. Mm. If they can do that, it's sort of really helpful. So thank you for that, yeah. and I'll make sure I find that. Um, you've, you've mentioned and, and spoken and written beautifully, Chris, about the kindness that you've witnessed and the generosity and the people walking through rubble, you know, to help people and animals um and I wondered if you if you sort of <laughs> inside Beirut and in Lebanon what what you think well what needs to be done next and if you if you if it doesn't sound too audacious to speak about it if you see mm. you and Gemma feel any hope or optimism for the future of Lebanon I mean it sounds to me that the people are amazing. <laughs> the, the, the people are amazing yeah. and, they're, and they're taking care of each other. So because I'm trying to, I suppose, in a realistic way, not in a sort of Pollyanna-ish way, but sort of think, OK, wh where's the hope here? Because I, f mm. I feel like hope encourages people to take action in a way that despair can make you just feel like there's no, it's not even worth trying. If you found a, yeah. or can identify any sort of hopefulness in the midst of all of this? Yeah, I mean... Obviously, I've talked about like the how kind people are and how people have come together to help people um, within the affected areas. But I think there's something, but both in October when when the the revolution started, and in a way, this is it's it continued going, and this is just an extension of it. But um, the the protest protests on Saturday show that. You know, even though Lebanon is, you know, is quite a sectarian society and, and there's so many people with lots of differences and so many scars from the civil wars, when, when the country comes together and when the people come together to demand something, they're so powerful, you know, that the, I remember in October standing in the, in the middle of Martyrs Square amongst those 
amongst the revolution, amongst the protesters, and hearing them sing and chant and every single person waving the Lebanese flag, which which is unusual because, you know, you go to lots of different areas, whether it's um, uh, a Christian area, whether it's, you know, a Hezbollah area, they, are, they have their own flags and their own identity. But in, in that revolution, there were only Lebanese flags. Everybody was one and speaking with one voice and demanding change. And I think Saturday that we weren't we weren't there on Saturday, but I think it's it's become even stronger. And if that if they can remain unified as a people, that shows real hope to me because I think there can be change. And there's there's a there's a you know without getting in too much into politics, there's a cabinet meeting today, um, and the the, the prime minister. Uh, Diab has basically talked some of his um, cabinet members into holding off their resignations until this meeting today. But there's a lot of talk that they might still resign, and if enough of them go, the government will have to, will will have to fully resign. And now, this is, when it happened before, you know they just got replaced. But this time, the whole world is watching, and and that kind of that united people has got the the eyes of the world and the support of the world and you know you've got um macron was here a few days ago and he spoke yesterday about the need for the people to be listened to and for their demands to be met and for change to be made and i think that it's possible but it's you know it's still undecided and you know i just hope that things can change and that people can be unified and, and that the, the you know the country's got such a as a tourist destination it's amazing you know that they've got that's their kind of their their usp and their, their natural resource in a way that you know their economy could really boom if they could if it could be a, you know become a, a a popular tourist destination there's so much hope in the country and so much um potential i was just going to say it's that change in you know, in 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 leadership and and how the country's run and reform and and just for people to be able to trust the politicians that run the country, that could you know that we could see a real change in Lebanon and something much more positive to come out of it. But um, you know, if if that happens, it's just unfortunate that the trigger for that has been something that was so catastrophic. Yes, although it, I guess it kind of. It sort of honours the suffering if something positive does come of it. Yeah. At least, at least there's that. Do yeah. you feel like, as far as you know, Chris? Sorry to make you uh, a, a, an expert in a, <laughs> in everything, but I just wondered if you're if you're sort of does it feel like are you aware that there are people in the wings, so to speak, politicians or activists in the wings that that mm. would that would be able to fill the gaps left by. A government that isn't working. Do people have are their names? Well, yeah. That's the that's one of the difficult things. Yeah. Is um. Is that there? That that's unclear. And I, I I mean, it's really difficult for us to be experts in it because we you know we can't we don't speak Arabic, so we we the only uh, local news that we can get is is the sort of English speaking news um which is often like really kind of simplified and not a lot of detail but um the 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 revolution has never really had um obvious leaders in a way um there's lots of people that kind of organize and and run and kind of get it going and um but you know in terms of having a, a people at the at the kind of top of the revolution and because it's such a people's revolution and it was it, it you know nobody led it it just it was spontaneous people just took to the streets nobody told them to they just turned up with lebanese flags and it built and built and built so it's a people's revolution and i think it's been difficult for people to the idea of having someone that leads that has been quite difficult and also you know are they going to be Christian or Muslim or Druze, 
you know that those difficulties of whoever that person is other other political parties or sects might have issues with that and so that's the difficult thing um but i think that you know when when the last government resigned and a new one was brought in the idea was that they were independent of political parties so they're not mps they're um you know it's not like the uk where the the prime minister chooses their cabinet from mps it's uh, the, the 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 prime minister i think um chooses uh actually i think some different different parties from parliament is quite difficult to get your head around um choose different candidates for different roles uh to be ministers but they're not mps so in theory they're independent because they're not from a political party but they weren't really they were put in by different political parties so it's like what happens if this government goes you know how do you bring in a, a truly independent government that are genuinely um experts in their field because that's one of the things that's demanded is a, a, a technocratic government people that are so your your econ, um, economy minister is an is an economist is an expert and has really good experience in that field rather than you know well i guess most governments i mean in the uk often the cabinet positions are not filled by people that have any experience in those um careers do you know what i mean yeah um i mean it'd be really interesting yeah. to to for you for mm. you for you and 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 and, Ev- and and lebanese people's to 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 see what happens next and and as you mm. said i hopefully it's helpful that as you said the world's eyes are on the situation because yeah. sometimes scrutiny and social media are really helpful, actually. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Chris, yeah. Chris, for yourself, for you and for you and Gemma, um, what, what have you made decisions about what's next and and what what you're going to do? Because you're in. So I should explain as well that you were very very generous and gracious in talking to me immediately after moving into your temporary new accommodation. Um, which is which is lovely of you. Um, but so, what what's your situation now, and what do you think might you, you might do next? Yeah, I, I mean, as I said, we're we're very much the the lucky ones, really. We 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 survived. We weren't injured. Um, we've lost a lot of stuff, but you know, a lot of it's insured. Hopefully, we'll get that back. But you know, the the main thing for us was that our the apartment that we'd lived in for. I think nine or ten months um, was destroyed, really, and that that was our home. You know, we'd 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 bought bits and pieces for it to make it homely, and we were settled there. And you know, our stay here was only ever going to be temporary because we're, we're we're here on tourist visas. You know, we're not on um, permanent visas or anything. So it was always going to be temporary. We were probably going to come back in February. So. Uh, come back to the UK in February so uh, you know we decided that um, to say we you know in six months we would be leaving anyway to find a new apartment and to kind of you know that for the time it takes to make that feel like home and um, we kind of felt like uh, now is a good time to to kind of call it a day and, and leave Lebanon which we're really sad about but you know, it was always going to be temporary. So, um, well, we're, st- we're going to stay for one more week, um, which gives us time to see people and, um, you know, say goodbyes and tie up loose ends and things like that. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, come back to the UK for for the for the short term at least. We're sort of, you know, we don't quite know what we'll what we want to do next but um no i mean you must still be both yeah. of you must still be in, in shock of course i mean it's it, it's almost incomprehensible yeah. to me to have experienced that and it's and it's <laughs> i don't know it's quite good to not make too many big decisions is it it's just like just yeah, keep, yeah. keep things i mean we, we said straight away let's let's take two or three days to decide uh whether we stay or leave and then we've kind of said let's you know we'll let's finish here, let's go back to the UK and then 
and then let's think about what we want to do next you know um and how are your friends there if you've managed to sort of catch up with friends and colleagues there and just sort of check in on them has that been possible or yeah yeah I mean it's like uh we so a lot of people that we know here live outside of the kind of immediate um kind of blast zone um so uh, you, you know that which which is really nice because then they've you know straight away when we first came out of the apartment after getting our essential stuff we suddenly stood in the road and it was dark and we were like we have no idea where we're going we just rushed to get stuff and get out and we had nowhere to stay and then we looked at our phones and we had all these messages from friends that live here saying do you need to come and stay with us um so that's been really nice and and to spend time with them and um and they've been so kind and looked after us and um you know I mean, everybody's um you know every, everybody that we know here has maybe been affected in some way but it's it's safe so oh good um, good i'm so glad to hear that yeah, chris it's good and if yeah. you um just to end on a sort of kind of little uptick <laughs> i wondered if if you if you in um if you were to so let's imagine you've come back home and then you go back to um you you you, you return to Beirut let's say in a year's time for for, for what mm. it's worth if you what would your hopes be on your return if you could wave your magic wand <laughs> and in a year's time <laughs> revisit Beirut what what would you like to see and how would you like it to be I mean I hope that they can rebuild the, I mean the the area where we lived I hope they can rebuild that because it was a real um had a really nice community feeling I mean it, it's funny because it was like there was quite a lot of expats lived there um it wasn't like an expat area you know it wasn't just like all British people or anything there was lots of Lebanese people but it was sort of it was really popular with young people basically because there were lots of bars or lots of restaurants you know on a Friday and Saturday night the, the, the road would be absolutely packed with people kind of just standing in the street drinking buying drinks from whichever bar just like a, a real kind of community feel to it and we'd go in because it was our, our kind of local area we'd go in bars and the staff would know us and the idea that that is gone is is really upsetting because it's it's a community that's gone it's not just buildings and belongings no um and it's really sad to see that in a way and i i guess we if we could come back in a year and it was rebuilt and this you know we the same people are there and that same sense of uh the kind of you know because it's a chaotic street you know there's there's cars and horns and there's people everywhere and which we love you know it really that's what Beirut feels like to us and I'd love to see that that still there because even before the the explosion there was people there was a sadness in Beirut because of the economic crisis and there was a sadness and it had lost some of that kind of joy and carefree feeling that that it that it had for us um and I, I'd I want to see that. Yeah. Like I want to see Lebanese people happy again, you know, because it's sad to have seen that decline. Yeah. I guess. Well, let's hope, you know. I think yeah. it, it sounds like with the, the spirit and the generosity and the kindness of the people that are there, and like you said, with everybody watching and with the support of agencies and uh, international mm. aid as well we can make that happen so thank you so much for your time Chris I'll make sure that um, in the copy for the podcast there's as much information as possible because I know loads of people are absolutely desperate and willing to help and, mm. and, and are really keeping their eye on it so that's a good thing <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'd, I'd also just I'd, yeah. I'd encourage people to um just because my, my knowledge of um, Lebanese politics and yeah. things and news is, is not 
amazing and I'm you know I may have been saying things that are, are slightly incorrect yeah no sorry I really put you on the spot with that <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There might be Lebanese people listening thinking, what on earth is he talking about? <laughs> um, but I, I'd advise, you know, go and read. It gets some coverage in the UK, but if you can look towards like um, like Arab news sources, I think there is one, there's uh, a fairly good, I think it might just be called Arab News or something, or Al Jazeera. Some of those news outlets that are kind of cover the Middle East, um, you, you'll get a a, a better sense of what's going on than from me waffling about it <laughs> well, there, there's hope there isn't there I mean I think we've all had a real during Covid in response to Black Lives Matters and other things have been like come on let's educate ourselves let's connect let's try and get our mm. information from more than one source let's be humble about what we don't know but embrace the finding out because actually it's it's really interesting to find out and encouraging and empowering so I think that's that's brilliant mm. to be reminded of that we can't know everything but we can find yeah. find it so um yeah I'm Definitely, sorry yeah. to try and make you an expert but it but it at the same time <laughs> it was it's really great to hear you talk about your actual on the ground experience of what that that's like I think it's really important to hear that mm. story so thank you so much for your time Chris when you're back I it's shall pleasure. definitely be uh it would be my great honour to get you in, uh, Gemma, a great big drink or dinner or whatever you fancy. <laughs> um, so yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, so um, look look forward to having you having you both back, and um, yeah, be safe. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Lots of love. It's a pleasure. Alright, thanks. Speak to you soon. Thank you so much for listening. All the information about uh, charities and organisations to support in order to support the recovery of uh, Beirut and Lebanon plus any information to other news sources is in the copy for the podcast. Um, Thank you very much for listening and look forward to joining you next time. Thanks, bye.